I want to welcome everyone back to part nine of my reading of Blockade by Anna Eisenmenger. Before I start, head on over to freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash movies. And there are links to Thomas and my watch and comment on the 1987 classic by Catherine Bigelow, Near Dark, and the 1976 Martin Scorsese, Paul Schrader classic, Taxi Driver. As the reviews roll in for that, we realize that uh, people are enjoying the cultural commentary, especially the fact that we can do it within the time frame of which it's shot and of which it takes place. So check those out. Before I start this, I just want to say I'm severely blocked up, having problems with my, uh, my, my nasal passages. I have a cough lozenge in that's helping a little bit. But if it sounds like I'm breathing hard, I am, because... Breathing is a little difficult right now, but I want to um, I want to finish this because I think this is maybe even I think this is on the level with Camp of the Saints in importance to see what World War One wrought and why people might have different uh, to see how Weimar came about, how things drawn out. And I hope you see that countries that were made out to be victims they were just when you lashed back at them they were just crying out in pain as they continued to try to strike you so yeah december 26 1919 unexpected happiness no pain is uninterrupted no misery unrelieved by joy the christmas eve i had so dreaded arrived i had this time prepared a little christmas table for wolfie only a tiny artificial Christmas tree, which came from a confectioner's shop and was lit up by miniature cam candles, stood in the middle. Out of a camel's hair rug I had, with Edith's help, manufactured a little coat and a cap, for Wolfie is already in the first class of the elementary school and has outgrown his old winter coat. Rudy gave his son's son the skates for which he had expressed an ardent desire, and Ernie presented him with a pocket knife which he wanted for a long time. O oh, blessed days in which a pair of skates and a pocket knife can bring happiness, happiness to its zenith. Of us all, only Wolfie and Lysel could hope to gain anything from the future. The rest of us were weighed down beneath a burden of losses which could never be made good. The baker who supplies our ration bread showed me behind his counter some small loaves and rolls made of white flour. He sold these Christmas surprises at 15 kronen each in utmost secrecy, for if the police had got wind of them, he might have found himself in serious trouble. Our good Viennese pre-war loaves and rolls, which every inhabitant of the town used to be able to buy at four heller each, had long passed into history. Wolfie knew them only by report. I determined to be extravagant and bought one of these forbidden luxuries for each of us. Every member of the household found a roll or a little loaf on his plate, and these modest dainties, which we had not tasted for so long, were the sensation of the Christmas Eve. Everyone enjoyed their appetizing crispness, and inevitably we recalled the times when we rejoiced in abundance of white rolls. Ernie fingered his little loaf for a, little, for a long time and told Wolfie how, in the days when there were still rolls in Vienna, many other fine things, too, were to be had, which had today are only recollections and how those days must at length return, if not for himself, at least for Wolfie and his generation. Our menu was of the most primitive simplicity. Oatmeal croquettes with potatoes, as housekeeper, I was proud to have potatoes in the house, and stewed apples cooked with raw sugar. Wolfie had persuaded his father to let him go to midnight mass with us, and so he went off to have a sleep after first making me promise that I would be quite sure to wake him at that right time. I must not forget to say that owing to the low temperature of the room, we all sat at tables in our coats and yet were not comfortably warm. In order that Edith might be able to spend the evening with us, I had asked her father, too, to be our guest. The silent and embittered man did not stay long, and I promised him that I would accompany Edith home after the Mass. Shortly before midnight, we all set off and walked to church through the quiet, almost deserted streets. As the snow, which had fallen heavily a few days earlier, had not yet been swept away from the dark streets, 
Our progress with our two invalids was difficult and slow. On the pavement were great lumps of frozen snow, which might be dangerous even to people with sound legs and good eyes. The temperature was apparently rising, for large watery snowflakes had lately floated down and made the clear paths of the footpath very slippery. Rudy walked with two sticks and refused all other help, and I led Ernie, who moved forward slowly, feeling with his foot at every step. Edith went ahead with Volfi and gave warning of any obstacles. Finally, we reached the church door. In previous years, crowds of people thronged to the churches in which Midnight Mass was celebrated. Here, too, there was a change this year. The spacious Baroque church was very well filled, but there was no question of overcrowding. Ernie, Edith led Ernie to the organ loft, and the rest of us had no difficulty in securing places near the Christmas tree, which, too, was now a very modest one and was decked with only a few candles. Here, as elsewhere, the electric light was no longer functioning, and so the church was sparsely lit by candles on the altar and a few tallow candles placed on the red marble pillars. War poverty does not halt even at the church door, said Rudy, as he sank heavil heavily onto the seat and adjusted his artificial legs. But I was resolved not to think here of war poverty or to let myself be robbed of my Christmas mood. After a short prayer in which I asked God to give me strength to go on fighting, I closed my eyes and waited. I knew Ernie was to play the prelude before the Mass, the mass and per I presently heard the notes of the organ, soft and compelling, as though from a great distance. I knew that Ernie would now be giving vent through his playing to all his prayers and his ardent longing that his sight might be restored to him. And as though, and as though the notes, like timid suitors, only by degree ventured nearer and nearer, the lamentation and entreaty growing even ever more insistent, the deeply felt harmonics moved towards a bold, tremendous climax which broke like mighty waves against the pillars and arches of the wide lofty building and then ebbed away again back to far sad distances where gra where gradually they were lost in silence some of the worshipers had turned their heads round toward the organ loft behind them they might well listen in amazement to strains of such earthly beauty after the notes of the Cherubini's Mass for Instruments, played by the church organist, had died away, Ernie began the prelude to the solemn hymn, Still Nacht, Heil Heilig Nacht. Then, unexpectedly, Edith's sweet, clear voice, at first faint, but then more and more boldly, joined in the soaring music of the sol sol solacional, which carries the melody. I know someone's going to email me about that pronunciation. Please don't. Edith sang one verse with a muted organ accompaniment, and when Ernie drew out the louder organ stops, all of us who were in the church sang the second and third verses. Therewith, the service came to an end. The church emptied quickly. All the musicians who had been playing in the organ loft came down the steep little staircase by the west door. Rudy, Wolfie, and I stood there and waited. The Christmas Eve had given me an experience. Ernie's playing was like an, in, an intimation from heaven that even when times were hardest, I must still be thankful and brave. Thankful for all the goodness and beauty which remained to us, and brave in order to regain or replace as far as possible the goodness and beauty we had lost. Ernie's playing had impressed Rudy, too. He is, divinely, he is a divinely inspired artist. His art can make up to him for the loss of his eyes. Since we had waited longer than seemed necessary and the sexton was beginning to put out the candles, Wolfie, who for some time had been attracted by the steep, narrow stone staircase leading up to the loft, offered to fetch the other two. As a watchful grandmother, I would not let him go alone, and so I took him by the hand and we mounted the stairs together. Since we were both wearing snow boots which muffled the sound of the footsteps, Ernie and Edith might, not, might well not hear us at once. The staircase door opened in such a way as to afford us immediately a view of the whole loft, the raised keyboard in the middle of the organist's seat in front of it. I held back Wolfie, who wanted to rush forward, and he remained standing shyly by my side. I saw the thick candles which were placed on, placed one on either side of the keyboard, in whose flickering light Edith's face stood out amid the surrounding darkness like a picture by an old master. Edith's face was bent a little downwards and she put her arm around ernie whose face head 
whose fair head rested on her shoulder. Thus they sat motionless, and when, in the emotion roused in me by this sight, I knocked against one of the chairs placed by the members of the orchestra. Edith looked across at me, smiling, but not in the least surprised nor startled. She nodded to me as I came nearer, she said softly, smoothing Ernie's hair with her left arm. Mother, this is our Christmas surprise. Ernie, without lifting his head from Edith's shoulder, said, stretching out his hand to me, God has sent me a Christmas angel who from this day will see that I have peace on earth. I went behind the organ seat and took the two dear took the two dear fair heads in my hands and kissed them with overflowing tenderness. Wolfie, completely puzzled, stood beside us, and when Edith rose and lifted him up and kissed him, he released himself with an air of embarrassment and ran down the stone stairs to join his father, who was waiting below. Then the sexton came to us to leave the church, and we left the organ loft without further explanation. We found that Rudy already had an inkling of the situation, for Wolfie had made use of Baroque Angel to illustrate how Aunt Edith had put her arm around Uncle Ernie. When we arrived home, happy but frozen through, Rudy quickly lit the little stove which I opened while I opened a tin of milk and heated some coffee, which we all drank in the best of spirits. We drank on this Christmas Eve to the health of the newly betrothed couple, and Ernie was as happy and cheerful as in pre-war days. Ernie and Rudy and I clinked coffee cups, and Ernie assured us that no champagne could ever taste as good. As Edith had come back with us, I persuaded her to stay for the rest of the night so that we could go on sitting happily together. Ernie spoke of the coming operation on his eyes, which would, he hoped, give him his sight, give him back his sight, and we all encouraged him in this belief. Then he began already to make plans for his marriage and hoped that his requiem would soon make his name so that he might offer Edith an assured livelihood. Rudy could not congratulate him enough on his engagement and consider that such a happy event should be suitably celebrated. He wants to entertain us at all at one of the cafes where new wine is tasted, and as Edith and Ernie agreed, I could not refuse. We all know Mother is no spoil sport, he said, and he decided that we should go to Rocker, Rockenbauer's in Grinzing on New Year's Day. I had already put Wolfie and little Lysel to bed when I took Ernie into his room to make everything ready for him for the night he said to me mother i hope you you do not think i hope you don't think that i dare to suggest chaining edith to my fate without waiting for my answer he went on it was edith herself who took the initiative and i only and i only reproached myself that i did not resist her god bless god bless edith i answered you will be happy Well, I think we all saw that coming. I apologize for the long pause. Um, just trying to stop the mouth noises and everything. So, all right. January 3rd, 1920. A painful meeting, still no peace. We really did go to Rockenbauer's and Grisning on the evening of New Year's Day. A friend of Rudy's who had served with his car in the automobile corps during the war and who now earns his living as one of the few taxi drivers in Vienna, their fares are mostly foreigners, offered to drive us to Grinzing in his car. Rudy chose Rockenbauer's as one of the liveliest cafes. Ernie must at least have lots to hear, he said, even if we have to do his seeing for him. Hearing will be all right, answered Ernie good temperedly, as long as I don't have to as long as I don't have too much smelling to do. Towards nine in the evening we drove in the roomy car to Rockenbauer's Cafe, a fine Gleisler Wein, where that day, by way of exception, the legal closing hour was to be ten o'clock instead of eight. The fact that our position was still so agonizingly difficult and uncertain and that peace was not yet restored had apparently only affected this cafe in so far as the lighting was concerned. On every table, a smoky candle was burning, and the music stands in the orchestra were lit by acetylene lamps. The spacious, crowded room was well heated by a big iron stove in which no inconsiderable portion of the woods of Vienna was being turned to ashes. 
as we came in, the band was playing the well-known Viennese song Das Leichel von Hernels, and many of those present were singing the words noisily and out of tune. From this singing, one could form some idea of the amount of new wine that had been consumed. The innkeeper, no doubt, had every reason to feel satisfied. Our appearance made a visible sensation. Ernie, with his fair hair and beautiful face, aroused lively sympathy on all sides when his blindness was noticed. As Edith, no less fair and lovely than himself, led him gently and carefully through the rows of tables to a recess which the host himself indicated to us, many eyes were fastened on them. Rudy, who was stumping on in front of me on his artificial limbs, stood still for a minute and let his eyes wander critically over the company. Look, mother, quite a change here, too. All war profiteers and speculators. He was right. Not only did Ernie get his fill of typical new wine rowdiness, but Rudy and I were struck by the great changes in the outward appearance of this old, respectable Viennese tavern. Between the jocular toasts painted on the walls hung white notices bearing the words, English spoken or si parla italiano. When in the past I visited a restaurant of this sort with my husband or a few friends, it was really a place where one met all classes of the population of Vienna sitting sociably and quietly enjoying a, good, a glass of good wine. The cab driver sat side by side with the count, the big manufacturer with the small tradesman. They were all wine tasters, and they drank the excellent liquor with the relish of connoisseurs and great good humor and did not take a, broke, a broad joke amiss. Ernie, who let us have the benefit of the various impressions he received through his sharpened sense of hearing, was at first astonished by the many foreign languages he could detect amid the babble of voices. Close to our recess sat a large party of people who were taking pains to talk good Viennese, but who constantly relapsed into what was evidently the more familiar tongue, their more familiar tongue, Yiddish. Among them, as though to mock us in these hungry times, there were some overfed women of the trading class. Together with their husbands, who were already the worst for wine, they ostentatiously consumed the sausages they had brought with them, as though expecting that all would envy them this wealth. These people were obviously in the provision trade for, at the present day, the provision trade is the most lucrative of all. As they were sitting not far from us, Ernie at once smelt the sausages, which were strongly flavored with garlic. What pleased Ernie best was the little orchestra, which played really well. It consisted of a piano, a guitar, a harmonica, and two violins. There was also a singer who, in the intervals, sang popular songs with great verse. Presently, he came to the front of the little platform, which was not far away from us, and in a rather nasal but soft tenor tone began the following song. Cease thou yonder cloud that, that hovers, where the moon and stars are bright. Like that cloud art thou, my dear one, like that cloud so small and white. Moon and stars are near the cloudlet. Far so far away they shine. Come down from thy height, my cloudlet. Let me put my lips to thine. Let me not consume by longing from afar to gaze at thee. I have been thy fool, my cloudlet. Let me now be. Let me now thy lover be. For some time his eyes had been fastened on Edith, and now, as is the custom in these cafes, he stepped up to our table and stood near her so as to sing to her directly. He sang on. Seest thou yonder cloud that hovers where the moon and stars are bright? Like that cloud art thou, my dear one, like that cloud so small and white. Come thou little cloud, O oh, come then, come, O oh, come at last to me. Moon and stars I'll be in heaven, all of them I'll be to thee. As he sang, he gazed at Edith with a lovesick expression so that everyone's attention was concentrated on our table. Edith entered into the jest and laughed at the singer at the same time, blushing the roots to the roots of her fair hair. Rudy took a note from his pocket and pressed it into the man's hand, for that it always for that it is always anticipated reward of such musical compliments. As the guests applauded vociferously, the man remained standing by our table and began once more to sing his song with its slow jazz rhythm. He was not halfway through it when Carl appeared beside him. He seized him violently by the arm and said in a loud tone, Don't annoy this lady. The singer, who was experienced in dealing with tipsy guests and imagined Carl to be one of them, took him by the arm and tried good-humoredly to persuade him to move away from our table. The proprietor, too, arrived on the scene and begged Carl not to disturb the evening's enjoyment, whereupon Carl broke loose from the singer and gave him a box on the ear, which sent the poor fellow reeling. As he was about to turn, 
As he was about to turn on the proprietor, too, a couple of waiters hurried up, and with their help, Carl was forcibly removed from the cafe. All this happened in a few minutes. Rudy had stood up, and Ernie, too, had risen from his chair when he recognized Carl's voice and placed himself in front of Edith. Edith's eyes had been anxiously fixed on Carl. While he was being ejected, I heard his voice saying, bloodsuckers, capitalists, and other words. From among the guests who made way for the struggling group consisting of Carl, the waiter, and the proprietor, a showily dressed young woman stepped forward and followed Carl as he was being hustled out none too gently. Edith had, like myself, noticed this much rouged and powdered young person, Leah, she whispered. That is Leah. And she told us that this was the woman she had once seen at the cafe in the Schonbrunnerstrasse. He is mad, said Rudy. Only a madman could behave like that. As Rudy's friend was not to fetch us with his car for another half hour, we were obliged to stay where we were. Although this scene had filled us with such grief and anxiety that we would rather have gone home immediately. The proprietor apologized to us, assuring us that the disturbance would not be repeated as the offender, who was entirely unknown to him, had gotten into a car with a woman and driven off in the direction of the town. It was well for him that he did, said the proprietor. Otherwise, I would have fetched the police and given him in charge. Thus, Rudy's kindly meant celebration of Ernie and Edith's betrothal ended on this ugly, jarring note. When we reached home, we discussed what was to be done. Since Carl had returned to Vienna, we had to be prepared for a visit from him, and I felt that I could not possibly forbid him to resume possession of his now empty room. Rudy fired up when I said this and declared that it was impossible to live under the same roof with such a fool, however sorry one might be for him. Ernie, too, disagreed with me. Edith acted as a mediator, saying that if Carl would guarantee not to disturb the peace of the household, we could not send him away in the event of his coming, for to do so would be to deprive him of any chance of a return to a normal way of life. But she added that she would prefer to avoid any explanations with Carl, which she unfortunately apprehends, for the expression of his face and the flickering, unsteady light in his eyes had filled her with horror. Nevertheless, she intended to inform him on the first opportunity of her engagement to Ernie in order immediately to put an end to any hopes he might entertain of someday winning her back. Although I did not wish to alarm the others to no purpose, Carl's behavior and the abrupt manner in which he had accosted us in the cafe had filled me with deep concern, and I reflected, reflected anxiously that his conduct might be yet another consequence of his head wound. Yeah, the head wound is called communism. Bolshevism. It filled me with sorrow to realize that since he seemed to have become completely estranged from us all, I was not in a position to help and advise him. It had struck us all that Carl, who, while he was at home, was ostentatiously careless in his dress, was yesterday wearing new and almost elegant civilian clothes. Leah's appearance, too, so Edith told me, ultra-fashionable in comparison with what it had been in the cafe in the Schonbrunner Schon since the day before yesterday, we have seen nothing of Carl. We can only wait. Ernie is obviously in a nervous state, and he is happy and at rest only when Edith is near him. I have asked Kathy to let me know immediately if she meets Carl, for I mean at all costs to speak to him. Perhaps as his mother, I shall have enough influence over his obstinate, uncontrolled mind to avert the scenes which we are dreading. She's painting a scene of uh, people rejoicing and showing off their wealth. And, yeah, I mean, what can you say? These people aren't Austrians. January 22nd, 1920. The currency depreciating more and more. Quotations of shares still rising. No peace. Still no peace. On the contrary, we housewives have to fight harder than ever to secure food and cope with the currency depreciation. Edith can now exchange the $2 a day which she has paid for her work at the American Mission for 400 kronen. The pension of a privy counselor who has served the state for 40 years amounts to 500 kronen a month. These former civil servants and officers whose pensions 
have not been adjusted to the unaltered value of the currency, like the wages of the day laborers and manual workers are undoubtedly the poorest of the poor in the state of Austria today. They have been accustomed to living perhaps modestly, but at any rate suitably to their position, and all the years during which they employed a settled income have rendered them absolutely unfitted for any kind of other employment, which has become very difficult to secure even by the young and robust. They are moreover too proud to press their claims. Thus, it happens every day again and again that elderly retired officials of high rank collapse on the streets of Vienna from hunger and undernourishment. And these are the more fortunate of their class, since they are carried in an ambulance to the hospital, where for a few days at least they can eat their fill. Speculation on the stock exchange has spread to all ranks of the population, and shares rise like air balloons to limitless heights. How can people fare fail to have their heads turned. Rudy and my banker congratulate me on every new rise, but they do not dispel the secret uneasiness which my growing wealth arouses in me. I have plenty for use, plenty of use for this wealth, which already amounts to millions, and without which I and my family would have starved before now. The frozen meat imported from America costs 200 kronen a kilogram, bacon 180 kronen. An English gift pa packet, which I was lucky enough to secure, was comparatively cheap. It crossed 98 kronen and contained four tins of milk, half a pound of rice, half a pound of sugar, half a pound of flour, half a pound of cocoa. The good quality of these things also filled us with admiration, and I kept them under lock and key like valuables. All these days we have seen and heard nothing of Carl, so we must conclude that he has again left Vienna. A few days ago, Shani called on me. When Kathy opened the door to him, he stalked arrogantly and without waiting to be asked into the sitting room. He was wearing a new uniform with red cord on his cap and sleeves and seemed very conscious of his own importance. Nonetheless, he advanced to where I was seated, darning the linen and, con and condescended to stretch out his hand to me. Since the revolution, handshaking had become an unpleasant modern custom, which seems intended to underline the democratic trend of our age and the notion of universal equality. Shani sat down. <laughs> Think about that. Since the revolution, handshaking has become an unpleasant modern custom, which seems intended to underline the democratic trend of our age and the notion of universal equality. Johnny sat down without waiting to be asked. Then he began a long-winded explanation of the purpose of his visit. He started with some angry diatribes about those cursed rascals, the peasants who worry the lives out of the Viennese, and then told me that he belonged to the food control committee of this district. Within the next few days, all the houses in this neighborhood were to be searched for provisions. Ever since we had an American living in our house, the general belief had been, he said, that we enjoyed a superflu... Super super superfluity of everything so that our flat in particular would be very thoroughly searched. We should therefore do well, he made the suggestion, of course, entirely in our interest to hand over our cigars to his keeping. So that's what he's after, I thought, and I turned over in my mind whether I should tell him that our supply of cigars was exhausted, but to do so might have been to lower myself in his estimation, which would at this time have been unwise. I went to the little cupboard where the cigars were always kept, and from the last box but one, I took out a handful, which I gave him, remarking that my remaining stock did not exceed the legal limit, but I, I thanked him for, for his advice. He thrust some of the cigars into his pocket out of, of his blouse, bit off the end of one of them, spat it out unconcernedly onto the floor and warned me before he left the room not to admit any inspectors who might call unaccompanied by himself as there were many swindlers about and so forth. Then he shook my hand once more and went away. However, his warning was of some service to me. I had already heard from acquaintances that even quite trifling quantities of food supplies were simply taken away by the Volkswehr commissions. Small reserve supplies, which housewives had put on one side, to provide against emergencies were confiscated. I therefore began to hide in ingenious ways everything I had in the house, which was, unfortunately, very little. Blind Dirty and Edith helped me. We hid flour in the in the big bronzed hollow, hollow plaster head of Palace Athene, which stood on the bookcase, and little packets of rice, sugar, and beans in the stuffing of the of the upholstered furniture. 
It is shameful, I said when he had finished, that nowadays one has to hide the little bit of food that has been secured with so much difficulty as though it were stolen goods. Things must change soon, said Edith consolingly, when once peace is signed. When? That is what we've been saying ever since October 1918, said Ernie, and now it's the 22nd of January, 1920. Edith caught hold of his hand and his face lit up with a radiant smile. Never mind, he said. Even now, everything is so much better and more beautiful than it used to be. And grasping Edith's hand in, hand in his own, he raised it to his lips. January 24th, 1920. Lysel again returned the first prisoners. In spite of great care and attention, little Lysel has had another attack of intestinal catter so severe that I have had once more to take her to the clinic. The reason for this digestive trouble is not hard to seek. The child cannot get used to almost daily changes in her milk, and thousands of infants are in the same case. Every fresh attack of this disorder endangers her life. During the last week, she has got, she has had some sweetened and some unsweetened tin milk, fresh boiled cow's milk, and goat's milk mixed with flour. Nowadays, there is no guarantee whatsoever that milk is good or fresh. One is thankful of what is called milk looks and tastes like milk. We hear of the first few sick prisoners of war have returned from Italy and France. Can this be the first steps towards the longed for peace? Two years. Two years of having to do this and the children are... Even if they don't kill them, I mean, Lysol doesn't grow up and achieve the kind of height, the kind of strength she would. She may not even be able to bear children. This is the plan all along. Even if you don't kill them, you destroy the next generation. We see that here. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to stop right there. One episode left after this. Um, if you want to support the show, freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash support. You get the episodes early and ad-free, and um, there's ways you can get access to the private Telegram group. You can support me there on the website, through Substack, through Gumroad, um, through Subscribestar, through Patreon, and um, yeah, early and ad-free episodes, access to the, access to the uh, Telegram group, which has some really good people in it. All right? Till the finale. Take care. Thank you. Bye.